Let's stand up and join them in that shout. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna to the King. Then let's sing it, tell me the stories. Good morning, folks. Happy Sunday and happy Palm Sunday. This is the end of our time together in the season of Lent. We're approaching the end of the season of Lent, and uh, we're celebrating this morning uh, Jesus' entry as the king into Jerusalem. And uh, just as they did uh, in that time, we mark that with the waving of palms and with the uh, shouting of Hosanna. To our God who saves. So I'm glad to be with you this morning. I'm glad you're here. I want to share with you just uh, a few things as we get going into worship. Uh, firstly, you will notice that in your bulletin, you should have had a connect card. And this is uh, a uh, place for us to just give some information. Uh, let me say, if you're a guest with us this morning, we are especially glad that you are here. Uh, your presence with us as a guest is an honor to us, and we're grateful that uh, you have joined us. And so we invite you uh, to uh, take the card in the bulletin and just offer whatever information you uh, feel comfortable offering. And because uh, we want to be able to connect with you, get to know you, and get you connected to the life of the church. And if you're a member here, if you're a regular tender, feel free, put your name, check member, and you're good to go. But if you're, if you're our guest this morning, we are, we're so glad that you're here and we want to be able to connect with you. So I invite you to take this and um, yep, let's, let's all take a moment now and uh, put uh, some of this info in the connect card. Let's take a moment and do that now. And you can take these uh, and put them in the offering plate as the ushers uh, pass them around this morning. You can take them and put them in there. Also notice that on the back of the card, there's a place to sign up for our Wednesday night meal. So you can sign up for that. Um, there's also a place to register for our ladies Bible study, which is starting in April after Easter. All right. So, uh, what else is going on? We have the last of our church growth workshops happening this afternoon, this Sunday afternoon at 3.30. Our Wednesday night meal is still going on this Wednesday night, although it is spring break, so we will not have children or youth uh, this Wednesday, but we will have uh, the Wednesday night meal. And uh, Judge Jones' class is still, right, we're meeting, is that right, Mike? The class for, yes, this Wednesday, yes, that's still meeting. Uh, this Wednesday night. So meal and class going on. We'll have a Maundy Thursday service this coming Thursday, 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. So you can mark your calendars for that this week, Maundy Thursday at 6 p.m. Um, as I said a moment ago, uh, the, a women's Bible study, a new women's Bible study is starting up uh, the week after Easter. Uh, Great content. Uh, I think it's going to be a great class. So I'm strongly, strongly encourage uh, our participation in this. I think it's going to be a great thing and a uh, great class. So, um, all right. We have an announcement that Mr. Bob Denier is going to come up and tell us a little bit more about. Okay. A lot of you heard this 
last week, but I'm going to keep reminding you until it comes up. April 6th, uh, we need church workers. We are going to recover the remaining 22 uh, sound boards in the Family Life Center. We've got the materials, you know, all the equipment and everything. So all you need to really do is bring yourselves. You might want to bring a hammer if you have it. But we need a lot of folks, you know, to do this job. Uh, and we'll break up into teams so that we can do it, you know, in an organized fashion. If any of you know, know me, uh, my background is engineering, and I am very organized. <laughs> so uh, please, you know, come on April 6th, put that on your calendar. When we finish, the Family Life Center is just going to look great with the new soundboards up there. Thank you. All right. Good deal. Thank you, Bob. And last announcement that I have, we have the Easter egg hunt that's going to be this coming Saturday here at the church uh, starting at noon. So our children's Easter egg hunt uh, this coming Saturday here at the church at noon. All right. Are there any other announcements? Anything else uh, we need to announce this morning? All right. Very good. Very good. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite uh, the Rice family to come forward because we have a wonderful thing to celebrate this morning. Uh, we're celebrating this morning the baptism of Mr. Walker James Rice. Look at, look at, that's just, that's just a handsome fella. Man, look at this guy. So, this morning, yeah, we're celebrating Walker's baptism. In the Methodist tradition, baptism is a sacrament, and that means it is an outward and visible sign of the inward and invisible grace of God and the way that God works in our lives. We believe that God's grace, God's forgiveness, and new life in Christ is open to all people of all ages and all places of life. And so this morning, that's what we celebrate. We're celebrating God's grace and God's forgiveness and new life in Christ uh, for Walker. So I will ask our parents and uh, godparents as we prepare to baptize Walker. Do you repent of your sin and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Do you believe in God the Father, in Jesus Christ his Son, and in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. Do you promise to nurture Walker in this faith, to pray for him and to help him grow in his discipleship in Christ? Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for Walker. We give you thanks for the ways that your grace is already working in his life. Lord, would you pour out your spirit on this water, Lord, that being born of water and the Spirit, Walker would be a faithful disciple of your Son, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, Walker, you ready, buddy? <laughs> Walker James Rice, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray again. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on Walker, that being born of the water and the Spirit, he would find new life in Christ and walk his days with him in this life and in the life to come forevermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's congratulate. And as we continue in worship this morning, at this time, I'm going to invite us to stand as we're able, and let's greet one another in the name of Christ. Will you stand and greet each other? And uh, good morning to those of you who are joining us online. I'm grateful that you have uh, tuned in to the service. I pray that in the service, through the words, through the music, through the scripture, you would find a word of hope and life in Christ. And I invite you to come join us in the sanctuary. We meet here at 1030. 
on Sunday mornings uh, in the sanctuary at St. James Methodist Church, and I invite you to come and join us. Blessings. Have a great Sunday. Worship with the words of the psalmist from Psalm 118. Let's join in this together. I will say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And you will say, for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Thanks be to God. 
Amen. Amen. And we will continue in worship together this morning.
Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Let's go to God in prayer together. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this day that you have made, for this joyful day, and we celebrate the truth that your Son is King. Lord, as we enter into this time of worship, Lord, would you help that truth enter into our hearts? Help it change our hearts and change our minds, Lord, so that we can come to see that your Son is who he says he is. And that he did what the gospel says he did. And that he can come to reign over our hearts and minds, even as he rules over all things now. We pray these things in his name, and we pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What a powerful name it is, 
As our ushers come forward for our time of offering, I'll remind you, you can take the card and put it in the plate as we pass it around. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for your great generosity towards us. God, would you give us grateful hearts? Lord, and use these, our tithes and our offerings and our gifts, that your kingdom would come on earth here as it is in heaven. In Christ's name, amen.
kids come down for Kid Connection this morning. I am Brandy Oliver. I'm the children's director here. And in just a moment, after children's uh, Kid Connection, we will go over to the building next door and we will have children's church. So if you're a visitor, if you're good, they'll go with me and then you can come back and pick them up um, over there. Okay, y'all going to sit down there, huh? Okay, I'm going to have to turn around. All right, so what is today? What are we celebrating today? On the count of three, everybody say it. Ready? One, two, three. Rock Sunday. Say it again on three. Well, louder this time. One, two, three. Rock Sunday. Is it Rock Sunday? No, what is it? Palm Sunday. Well, what on earth could rocks have to do with Palm Sunday? Do you know? You don't know? Well, I'm going to tell you. Okay. So, we are celebrating Palm Sunday. We're celebrating when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and all the people were so excited because a king was coming to see them. And they were shouting, what? Y'all can do better than that. On three. One, two, three. Hosanna. And Hosanna means save us. And they thought that the King Jesus had come to save them. They thought he was an earthly king, though. They were soon about to find out that he was much more than an earthly king. He's a heavenly king. But there were people who didn't like people cheering for him. And they told Jesus, stop them. Tell them to quit cheering. Tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you what, even if I tell them to be quiet, even the rocks from the ground will start cheering and praising my name. And he was letting them know that he was such an amazing heavenly king that everything on earth would be praising his name. And it might be cool to see a rock start cheering Jesus' name and praising him. But I am so thankful that he lets me praise him because he loves me so much and he loves you so much that we don't need a rock to do it for us. We can cheer Hosanna and praise his name every day. So when we get to our room, I'm going to give you a rock. I'm going to let you pick one out. And this is going to be a blessing rock. And don't put it in your pocket because mom will get on to me when she goes to washing. Put it on your nightstand. And every night before you go to bed, pick up that blessing rock and think about all of your blessings that you have from God. And every morning, pick up that rock and think about it again and ask God not to let you miss any blessings that day. Okay, let's go to God now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we don't need a rock to cheer out blessings to you. You give us so many blessings. We are blessings are abundant, and we can cheer and praise you, Lord, and we do today on this Palm Sunday and every single day, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all of our blessings. Lord, don't let us walk a day without recognizing your blessings because they are all around us. We love you. In Jesus' sweet name we pray, and all God's children said, amen. Stand at the door. All right. Thank you, Miss Brandy. See y'all later. So this is the season of Lent, and in the season of Lent, we have been going with Jesus through the gospel story as he makes his way to Jerusalem and to the cross and crucifixion and ultimately to Easter Sunday. So we've been on the road with Jesus, listening to what he says about following him, what he says about discipleship, what he says about his mission. And we've come now 
to, in, in a manner of speaking, the end of the road. The end of the road with Jesus, which is here, as he enters into Jerusalem for the last part of his mission. So we're going to read this morning from the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Hear these words. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was a boy growing up, one of my favorite stories was the story of King Arthur and the legend of King Arthur. When I was growing up, my dad would read to my brother and I the stories about Excalibur and the sword and the stone. And I love those stories, and they're deeply embedded uh, in, in my heart and mind. And as I'm older and as I reflect on those stories, I think about what makes them so powerful, what makes the legends of the king so powerful. You look at it, you know, in British culture and for hundreds and hundreds of years, the stories of King Arthur, his legend that he was a good king, the rightful king of all Britain, and that he would someday come back and set things right and rule in a just society over Britain. I think about what makes those so powerful, what makes those legends of the king so deeply embedded in the British cultural consciousness and not just in that culture, but if you look at cultures all over the world, There are stories of the true king, the true and good and right king, or the true chief, the one who is truly meant to rule. And what makes those so powerful is those those stories, those legends, all of that so deeply embedded in cultures all across the world, what makes that so powerful is that we know on a deeply human level, that it makes all the world of difference who is on the throne. It makes all the world of difference if the true and good and right king is ruling and on the throne. Or if not, And it's a bad king. It's the wrong king. If you look at the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 29.2 says that when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. So what does that mean? When the true and right and good king is truly enthroned, then there's flourishing. Then there's joy then there's goodness, then there's justice. 
But if that's not the case, if the true and rightful king is not on the throne, then we're in a bad spot. What we have in this, our passage from Luke's gospel this morning is a memory, a historical snapshot of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as the true and rightful king. Luke wants us to know that this is the guy. This is the one who has every right to rule. He is the true and good and right king. So let's look a little bit. I want us to go through some of our passage this morning and hear what Luke is teaching us about Jesus as the true king. Jesus, as he's entering into Jerusalem, sends two of his disciples ahead of him. He sends two of them ahead and says, go get me a colt that no one has ever ridden on. Untie it and bring it to me. And so they do what Jesus says. They find things just as Jesus says they would be. And they bring the colt back to him. Now, why, why is it important? Why is it significant that Jesus makes this request of his disciples? Zechariah 9 gives us, the, this prophet gives us this word of prophecy This is Zechariah 9, verse 9, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is the true and right king. Because he is the humble and obedient servant. Jesus is the true and rightful king because he's the humble and obedient servant. If you, if you go to Philippians, look at what Paul says in Philippians about who Jesus is in chapter 2. Paul says that Jesus, even though he was equal with God, he didn't consider that something to be grasped at or exploited or used to his advantage. But instead, Scripture says, Jesus took the form of a slave, took the lowest position that one could possibly take in society in his obedience to God. And not just that, he went lower than that, not just a slave, but he submitted himself to die like a slave, to die in the lowest way one could possibly die, and that is through crucifixion. But, Paul says, because of that, because he did that, God raised him up and set him on his throne so that every knee and every power, every ruler in the world has to knee and has to confess that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the true and rightful King. And he comes in to Jerusalem lowly and meek and humble, but he's going to ride out on Easter Sunday as a king. Because he was obedient, because he went the way of crucifixion. God raised him up. As Jesus is riding along, it says that the people spread out their cloaks in front of him as he was going along the road. That is an ancient symbol of reverence. It's an ancient symbol. You can see it if you go back to the book of 2 Kings. The people spread out their garments on the road before the king to show reverence. The, their, it says they, they, they put their cloaks, which is their outer garments, their coats, and they spread them out on the road. And their garments, in this instance, it's an extension of their very selves. It's an extension of their person. What's happening right now is that the people are recognizing the true king and they are laying their very selves at his feet. They're laying their selves down before him. 
And so Jesus comes in and they lay their garments down before him and they begin rejoicing because they know that this man has done great works. He is healed, he has fed the hungry, and there is joy in his presence. They recognize that the true and rightful king has arrived, and there is great joy. But not for everyone, because some of them in the crowd, the Pharisees, see him, and they say to Jesus, Teacher, tell these people to be quiet. Tell your disciples to hush. Now, why do they say that? It could be a couple of things. One, they could be worried that with all this commotion, it would stir up, uh, it, it, would, it would cause the Roman authorities to give their attention to this. That could be some kind of potential uprising. And any kind of potential uprising, Rome's going to come in with sword and with power and put it down. So that may be what their concern is. But if you look at the rest of the Gospel of Matthew and the way that the Pharisees interact with Jesus, what's more likely, they are rejecting him as king. And they see this as blasphemy. They say that Jesus is not the true king. And they want the disciples to hush because they think the disciples are committing blasphemy and giving Jesus a title that he doesn't deserve. They refuse to put the true king on his throne. And Jesus, then Jesus answers them and he says, Well, I tell you, if these were silent, if these were not praising me, the stones themselves would cry out. What does he mean? What does he mean? If, 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 if these were silent, the stones would cry out. The New Testament makes it very clear that Jesus is the undisputed, unchallenged Lord of all creation. That he really died and God really brought him back from the dead and set him as king over everything. And no one's response to that changes that fact. Jesus says, look, people can be silent, people can praise me, but I'm still the king. I am still the king, and if the people don't praise me, then the earth itself cries out that I am the true Lord. I want to share with you for a moment, something that I think is very, uh, very much a sign of our time and very much a word to us about what the scripture is teaching us about acknowledging Jesus as the true king or not. What I want to share with you is, is this, this information that comes from uh, the Barna Group. The Barna Group is a Christian polling firm, and for the past 20 years, they've been taking these uh, surveys across America about the state of Christianity, about uh, church attendance, about practicing Christians. And they've collected this data over the past 20 years, from the year 2000 to the year 2020. I want to share, you, share with us you know, what some of their findings are, and it's this. They say that practicing Christians now 2020 and forward, practicing Christians are now a much smaller segment of the entire population. In 2000, that is, in the year 2000, when they started doing this research, surveying uh, the state of Christianity in the country, 45%, and this was like tens of thousands of people, okay, surveying a lot of people, 45% of all those sampled qualified as a practicing Christian. So they, they identify practicing Christians as those who identify as Christian, okay, they say they're a Christian, agree strongly that faith is very important in their lives, and have attended church within the past month. So 45% in 2000, 
uh, of those sampled qualified as practicing Christian. That share has consistently declined over the last 20 years. Now, just one in four Americans, 25%, is a practicing Christian. Or in other words, the number of practicing Christians has dropped in half since 2000. So if you think about that, out of the country, Christians in the country, who said they were a practicing Christian, in just the last 20 years, half no longer serious followers of Jesus. So why do do I bring this up? Why, Why do we talk about this? Well, Jesus is the rightful king. We also have to recognize that he is a rejected king. Go back to our passage. The people are praising Jesus right now. But in just a matter of days, the crowd is going to go from praising him to shouting, crucify him. Kill him. He's not our king. Jesus is rejected. The true king shows up and we kill him. How how we respond to Jesus as the rightful king makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. And Jesus was not just rejected as king when he came 2,000 years ago. He is rejected again today. And it's important for us to see that. It's important for us to recognize that. That's that's what we're, when we're talking about these statistics, we're not just talking about numbers, we're talking about people's lives and people who have decided that I'm not going to live as if Jesus is really king. I'm not going to spread myself out before him. I'm going to go find something else. I'm going to go find something else in my life to enthrone, to spread myself out before. That's what we're seeing in, in, in our time. Now, that's, that's what we're seeing is, is folks are walking away from the faith and saying, I'm going to go give my life to something else. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let me say the word of hope, because I know that, is, that, that, that doesn't sound particularly hopeful, but if we are willing to recognize Jesus as the real king, as the true king, if we're willing to spread ourselves out before him, and acknowledge who is really king and give all of our lives to him, it makes all the difference in the world. And what I mean by that is consider this. Consider that in in this same amount of time, in the same amount of time, uh, 2000, 2020, this, this millennium, that in the same amount of time that the number of practicing Christians has dropped in half, in our country. At the same time, rates of depression and anxiety have steadily climbed year after year. Now, I know that correlation doesn't equal causation, but do we really think that's a coincidence? I don't, I don't think so. I believe we can say what's happening is that we're going and laying out our lives before other things. We're not worshiping Jesus as king, but we're worshiping something. Whether it's our job, or whether it's our family, whether it's uh, success, whether it's uh, our own bank accounts, we are going to spread ourselves out before something. And 
when we do that, when we enthrone something else, make something else king, those are not merciful kings. If we try to spread ourselves out for a job, or even for a spouse, for another person, for a family, for our child, for anything that is not Christ, we're not going to get our lives back. We will not receive mercy from those rulers. But all I'm trying to say, folks, is that if we do decide to be serious followers of Jesus and spread ourselves out entirely before him, enthrone him in our lives, and give him everything, then we will receive mercy because he is a generous and gracious king and he's the only true king. Do you remember what Proverbs said? When the righteous are in authority, when the right king is enthroned, the people rejoice. There's joy and there's flourishing. But when the wicked rule, when the wrong king is enthroned, the people groan. So as we enter into the season, as we enter, as we prepare to head toward Good Friday and Easter Sunday, friends, remember who the true king is. See what's happening in the world as as those many, many are falling away and no longer enthroning him. And let us praise him as king and trust that he is going to rule and lead us rightly into health and joy and goodness. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this account that is given to us, the truth of this account that you rode into Jerusalem as the true and rightful king. Help us, Lord, to see the ways that we enthrone other kings in our lives. Help us to see what's happening in this great walking away from you, from who you are. May we spread ourselves out before you, Lord, trusting that you are good and merciful and that you rule in truth and justice and goodness and that you will lead us into life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How great thou art.
great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Now, will you receive this benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and bring into your heart the truth that his son is the one and right king. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.